Okay, like I said, hold on to these. We'll do an assignment here in just a minute uh, using these. So if you would, hold on to them. Like I said, okay, today's topic is how to write a rhetorical analysis. So project one in this course is writing a rhetorical analysis of either the DNC nominee speech or the RNC nominee speech. Uh, everybody know what I'm talking about when I say DNC, RNC? So Barack Obama's uh, acceptance speech or John McCain's acceptance speech. You can choose either one of those, but you've got to choose one or the other to write a rhetorical analysis of. Uh, also, one other thing, and we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get to the project one assignment sheet, which I'm going to hand out in a minute here, uh, is to, uh, you're doing an analysis of the text of the speech. So you'll want to find a printed version of the speech online as soon as it's completed. Uh, and that's up to you to be able to find those. We can talk about how to do that uh, next week after these speeches have been delivered. But in other words, you're not doing a, a rhetorical analysis of the delivery itself, of the hand gestures, of the way that the speakers project. Uh, your goal is to, is to do a rhetorical analysis of the text itself. So, well, how do you go about writing a rhetorical analysis? You know, that's going to be the topic of today's discussion. And really, truly, Unit 1 as well. Are there questions about what a rhetorical analysis is as we're getting started here? Okay. I wanted to uh, ask you guys, was, how many folks were able to get the textbook, the uh, Ward and Vanderlei textbook? Everybody, it looks like. Was anybody not able to? Okay. So you were able to get a textbook. Uh, did you have any questions or concerns about the homework assignment as you had it? You had to read the first 14 pages of the book, write a summary and response to it. Any questions or concerns about the homework? Anything? Pretty straightforward. For you new guys, uh, were you able to get the book as well? Yes. Excellent. And we have anybody else that's new in here today? Okay. Well, let me hear some of the things that you summarized. Obviously, you couldn't put everything, all 14 pages, into uh, a one to two page summary. So, what kinds of things did you summarize? You're going to have to speak up a little bit over the. Excellent. So we had these, there was these nine common questions that they talked about. Yes? Right, the different strategies. Any one or two that stand out to you specifically, Tyler? Um, skimming beforehand. Yeah. That's a, a great suggestion. Uh, is that something that you usually do, kind of just skim through it first and then go back and kind of get, I mean, that makes sense. It's a great, it's a great strategy. One of the things that I like about this is they give very practical advice about how to go about reading and, and writing rhetorically. There's a very sort of pragmatic, practical perspective on how to do that. Uh, anything else? Yasmin, how about you? Um, I okay. Excellent. Yeah, I think the nine questions that, that Ward and Vanderlei start with, they really do help give us a focus as readers and as writers to think about when we're going about writing a document. Um, certainly there are, there are other questions, but they lead into these, you know, these main uh, components that they talk about, you know, the purpose, the topic, and the point. And in any kind of writing that you're doing, if you can cover those three components to begin with, you're on a, you're on a good track. If you know what your purpose is in writing a document, uh, for example, the letter that we had the other day that you guys wrote, uh, the purpose of that letter was to introduce yourself to a specific audience. Uh, it might have been an employer. If it was an employer, then your purpose was to kind of sell yourself to the employer and explain to that employer why you're the best candidate for the job. Um, so purpose is absolutely critical. There are four things that I mentioned in class on Wednesday called the rhetorical context, and you'll hear me repeat these things a lot. Uh, you know, the, the author, 
the audience, the topic, and the purpose. That's the context that surrounds a particular piece of writing. Uh, these are the four elements that comprise the rhetorical context. That's the kind of thing that might show up on a unit one quiz. Uh, so you want to know the four elements of the rhetorical context. And they correlate nicely to what Ward and Vanderlei describe as uh, this, uh, you know, the, the purpose, the topic, and the point of any given piece of writing. Again, the rhetorical context of a written document is who is the author? Who's the person actually doing the writing? That's part of the context. It's part of the situation, if you will, of a, of a piece of writing. Who is the author? What values do they bring? Uh, who are they writing for? That's the audience. You know, who, as an author, who are you writing for? Uh, and then the purpose of what you're writing. What is, the, what is the point that you're trying to get across in your writing as the author? And then ultimately, what is the topic about? What is it that you're writing about? Who can tell me what the topic was of the letter that you were writing last Wednesday? That's a softball one. Go ahead. Yourself. Yourself, right. You guys were the topic of the letter. You were talking about yourself and your skills and your uh, parts of your character that contribute to being who you are. Anybody else summarize anything a little bit different than what we've talked about? Go ahead, Delisa. Um, my summary is basically how to connect to your audience as a writer yes. and how a reader should try to connect to the writer. Excellent. Yeah, I approached all three questions like how they summarize it from a writer's mm -hmm. point of view and then as the turn they offered suggestions for both to make it easier. Like That's great. Yeah, they kind of break it down in terms of the read, in, in terms of rhetorically reading and rhetorically writing. They make this distinction. Uh, I, I, I don't want to shoot right over the, the audience component of this, too, because I think audience is huge. I think, I, I mentioned this on Wednesday, I think one of the skills, I mean, obviously the, cor the, the purpose of this course overall is to teach uh, and discuss how to, how to improve your writing. And one of the things that I think that, that, that can totally help in improving your writing is a better grasp of who your audience is. And it's true for me, too. The better I know you guys, the better I can deliver a particular lesson to you and I can connect with you. Uh, and whether you're speaking to a class or whether you're speaking to a group of friends or whether you're speaking to a boardroom or whether you're speaking to an employer, the better you know their background and experiences the more likely you are to be able to connect with them, the better you can use those connections uh, to actually form a bond with, with the person who is your audience. And so audience is absolutely critical uh, in understanding that. But all of these things working together is really what you ideally want to go for, is knowing who you are as the author, who your audience is, what your topic is and what the purpose is. Uh, and the better you know all of those and the, the more fluidly they work in tandem uh, the more effective the writing will be. Anything else that you guys summarized? And I think that's a great point too that you mentioned about the distinction between writing and reading rhetorically. Uh, was there anything that, were the strategies similar, different? Well, I mean like they were talking about how once you understand, as a reader, once you understand the author's mm -hmm. purpose, they may not be the same, but like once the reader gets, they kind of have control of the situation. Totally. And they would just like they offered different suggestions, like mm -hmm. with reading, they, they suggest to break it up, and then with writing, they suggest to like keep going and don't break it up. Like if you stay, if you start writing, sure. stay writing. You know. So. I think that's excellent. Reading for purpose is 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 really critical. And again, it kind of comes back to the sort of the practical advice that Ward and Vanderlei give us too as readers is. When you're reading something, you know, how do you read it? Do you read it to take notes? Are you reading it going, okay, what's the highlighted stuff that's going to show up on the quiz? Are you reading to dialogue with the author? You know, are you going, oh, I don't agree with that point, or I could see how this could work better, or wow, this makes me think about this other project that I could do, and, you know, do you have a dialogue going on with the text? Ultimately, I think that's a high goal to have, is to, is to be able to engage with the text. Um, you know, and, and I think reading for purpose is 
is critical to understanding what an author's intent is. If you can say, well, what is the, what is the purpose of chapter one? Who can tell me what you think the purpose of chapter one by Ward and Vanderlei is? There's no right or wrong answer here. What is, what is the purpose of chapter one? Yeah, how to read and write rhetorically. Say again. So for papers that can come up later on. Oh yeah, yeah. Preparing you for what you know you're going to have to do later on as a writer and as a reader. Uh, excellent. Sure. You know, it, it sets up the kinds of questions that we as readers should be asking going into a project. That's absolutely accurate. You know, that's great. These are great things. So understanding what that purpose is and does the purpose change a little bit from chapter one to chapter two? Do they have a different purpose in chapter two uh, or chapter three? These things are essential. So, what did you like, you know, I've got here, what did you like about the homework assignment and then what did you not like? This is more feedback, well it's feedback from me. I can't, you know, one of the big things that, that as a teacher that, that I look forward to is, is trying to grow a little bit myself and, and learn what works and what doesn't work and, and fine tuning. And I can't grow unless I know where you guys are at with a particular lesson or idea, which is a platform now for me saying if you ever hear something that just doesn't work or if you have suggestions I want to convey and communicate that I'm open to that and I'd love to hear your feedback about how the class is going uh, if a particular assignment is or something we do in class is utterly boring let me know uh, I, I want to develop and grow myself as a teacher so what did you guys like about this reading and and homework assignment in general and then what maybe did you not like go ahead Mm -hmm. That's excellent. So you guys found it relevant? Do other people agree with that? Other ideas? What do you like about it? Great. Yes. Yeah, you know, they give this sort of balanced perspective on writing. It's not, you know, all you know, sunny and roses. It's, it, the reality is that writing a lot of times is very difficult and arduous work for some people. Uh, I, and I, like, I love the example. That's a great example from the text of an example of how somebody feels about writing. Uh, somebody else, what else do you like about it? I or liked, not like? Go ahead. Um, I like that we were able to just um, summarize what we thought was important in the chapter instead of having like a set of like questions that like that's cool yeah one of the things that's a great point that that I'll hopefully try to do in this class uh, as well as with this particular assignment is constantly have you reflect a little bit on your writing or a lesson if we have time today I've got a reflection that I wanted to do at the end of this uh, I think it kind of helps to sort of pull everything together and summarize your thoughts whether it's a reading or uh, whether it's a particular lesson to, to kind of to, to have the freedom to choose you know to say what you want to say or need to say about something that's great anything that really kind of didn't work about this assignment you guys are being nice huh <laughs> it was better than just going and answering questions that they have in the back of the book right Although that's getting me worried because we do have questions on assignments coming up in a couple of weeks. So. Uh, but I'll balance it. You know, if we get to where we're doing too many reading response questions with assignments, let me know and we'll go back to doing something else that works a little bit better. You're, like just, a, you're just going through and you're finding a way to question this and you read that part of it. But if you're in a hurry or something, you're not going to read the rest of it. You're just going to have your own. So. Mm -hmm. It's true. I guess you shouldn't have that. Well, sometimes, you know, you don't have enough time to do a particular assignment. As long as you come somewhat prepared, you know, that's, that's the key. Uh, I've definitely done, I do interviews through community access with authors. And I've been very well prepared for some interviews on television. And I've done a few where 
you know, I was pulling it out out of my out of my shirt sleeve uh, to, to pull off the interview, and that's just part of life. I mean, that's what we do. I think the more prepared you are, obviously, the better, the stronger your position is going to be. Um, but you know, stuff happens. Um, excellent. Well, let me go ahead and take up the homework for today. You guys wrote this summary. Uh, if you would just make sure your name is on it and then pass it to the front of the room. Uh, if you don't have a staple, just bend over the corner. I'd, maybe we have a stapler, but I don't think so. And then just pass them to the front of the room. And then you guys at the front of the rows, if you would not mind bringing these up, that would be great. And just set them there, thank you. All right, so we've got uh, project one here. Delisa, would you mind handing these out to the rows here? I'm kind of strapped in back here. This is the uh, project one uh, assignment sheet. So this actually goes into detail about how to actually execute and write project one. <coughs> Did everybody get a copy? <coughs> All right, so uh, this is the Project One assignment sheet, a rhetorical analysis of the 2008 DNC or RNC nominee speech. Uh, you can see, just kind of skimming over it, you've got the purpose and audience section, uh, the focus and scope of the analysis, and then at the bottom, the technical matters for this particular assignment. Uh, the length needs to be three to four pages, about 900 to 1,200 words. The grading weight for this is 15% of your total grade in this course. Uh, and then the documentation style for this is going to be MLA. Does everybody know what I mean when I say MLA format? Okay. We'll talk a little bit more about documentation style as the semester goes along. The two big ones are MLA and APA that we'll be addressing in this course. So what's the purpose and audience for this particular uh, assignment? Question? Yes. Oh, the speeches. Uh, I think Obama's is this Thursday, and then McCain's is sometime next week. And again, and we'll talk about this as I get into this, your analysis is of the text of the speech. I mean, it's good to watch it. I'm sure all of you will watch it on YouTube or whatever uh, to actually see the speech itself. But Ultimately, what you're analyzing is going to be the text itself. So you're going to want to find a printed copy of the speech on Friday. They may even have copies of it available online Thursday. A lot of times the, the speakers will have it available beforehand, but it'll definitely be online, hopefully, uh, by Friday. And, well, let's look at this. The purpose and audience of, for and of this paper. Uh, in this paper, you will analyze either Barack Obama or John McCain's nomination acceptance speech in order to identify and examine its rhetorical elements. So you want to think of these rhetorical elements. You guys read pages 1 through 14 for today, and uh, Ward and Vanderlei lay out these nine different general areas that you could be using as a basis for examining any written document. You know, what is its purpose? What is its topic? How does it connect with its audience? What is the style that an author uses? Uh, so you're going to be identifying and examining rhetorical elements in the speech itself, in the text of the speech. Again, I want to emphasize you've got to choose one of these. Don't compare them. Don't do a comparison contrast of Obama's to McCain's speech. That's not the purpose of this assignment. Uh, choose one. The goal of this assignment is twofold. One, to gain an understanding of the distinctive features of speech writing. And then two, to begin to develop rhetorical analysis skills that will help you recognize the distinctive features of other kinds of writing as well. So one of the neat things about this kind of rhetorically based approach to writing is you can really apply it in all kinds of different uh, writing contexts. 
So you may be able to apply it you know, to a speech, these tools like what is the purpose, what is the audience, what is the topic, what is the style that's used, uh, how is it organized, what's the logic of it. You could use that in analyzing a speech, you could use it in analyzing a poem, you could use it in analyzing a three-year business plan for a company. Uh, you could use that strategy, this rhetorically based approach to writing in analyzing just about any kind of written document. If a document is well executed, it's going to have a topic, it's going to be about something, uh, it's going to have a purpose, generally speaking, it's going to have an author, it's going to have an audience. So the point is, I think this rhetorically based approach, is, it's really cool because it's kind of universal. You can apply it in a lot of different uh, language contexts. Uh, so, but in this particular context, we're looking specifically at a speech. But the tools that you'll be using, you could use in other types of writing as well. Your analysis should be written for an academic audience of fellow students. So your audience for this assignment is your fellow students who, like you, are exploring the conventions of academic writing. Your purpose, your purpose is to present fresh ideas and insights to these students in discussing the basic rhetorical elements of speech writing and what purposes these elements are intended to accomplish. So again, we have all these rhetorical elements that we've been talking about, uh, you know, purpose, topic, author, audience, uh, and others like the, the author's establishing credibility, the author's connecting emotionally with an audience, the author's use of logic and structure and organization. Any of these rhetorical elements uh, you could choose to, to use as a basis for analyzing the speech. You don't have to do all of them. Obviously in a three to four page paper you're going to want to select two or three max, if not just one, to look at uh, in the speech. So again, your purpose is to present fresh ideas and insights to your fellow students in discussing the basic rhetorical elements of speech writing and what purposes these elements are intended to accomplish. And that again, like we have on the notes here for today's point, is really critical. A rhetorical analysis is a point-driven examination of how language is, is used. It's not enough to just say, well, this is what he says first, this is what he says second, this is what he says third. You say, well, this is what he says first because what he's trying to do is establish a connection with his audience. Or he says this first because he's trying to establish his credibility as a politician. Uh, so, and then, then taking it a step further and examining, well, is it effective? Does the audience respond well to it? And that's what analysis is all about. You'll do this by showing how these elements are represented in the written text of the speech you're analyzing. Are there questions about the purpose and audience for this? Anybody? Any questions? Let's take a look at the focus and scope of analysis. Okay, again, reiterating, your paper will analyze either John McCain or Barack Obama's acceptance speech. Uh, it's your choice. You can choose to analyze either one, but you need to choose one of those, not both. Uh, you'll need to find a text version of their speeches online, and it is this text version that you will analyze. That is, you're not analyzing Obama's hand gestures, voice projection, posture, uh, which would be fine for a type of rhetorical analysis, but that's not what the scope of this analysis is. It, that would fall within a different domain. Uh, of looking at delivery, specifically how is a speech delivered. Uh, but for this we're doing a textual analysis. You're looking at the words on the page. Um, chapters 1 and 2 of Real Text discuss uh, these nine categories of rhetorical choices. And the table on page, pages 2 to 3 is kind of a quick guide to those. Any of which you could use as the basis for your analysis. Again, I want to emphasize you could choose any one of those, uh, maybe one or two of those elements. Uh, and there are a lot of elements discussed in chapter two, which is the reading for Wednesday uh, as well. Other example areas you could analyze. How do the nominees develop credibility in their speeches? How do they develop emotional attraction? How do they organize their speeches or develop logic? Any one of these points would be 
fertile ground for examining their speeches and analyzing their speeches and analyzing the language specifically of their speeches. How do they relate to and connect with their audiences? What kinds of language do they use, you know, to connect with the audience? Do they talk about their background? Uh, does that connect with the audience? Are they engaged with where folks are coming from economically, uh, financially, uh, working, you know, class folks? Are they connecting with that? Who is their audience? So audience is totally an area that you could examine. What stylistic choices do they make? Uh, for example, language features like, do they use a lot of colloquial speech? Or are they using more formal speech? Do they use a balance of both? How do they balance those? Uh, so all of these things are, are prime areas that you could use, or are perfect areas that you could use to examine these speeches. In your analysis, you'll want to identify which speech you're analyzing. This would be in the introduction. If you're taking notes here, you could write in the introduction. You definitely want to identify which speech you're analyzing. Uh, and then what rhetorical elements you'll focus on. That would make up the introduction part of, of your analysis. You, know, you definitely want to say, well, I'm going to be looking at you know, the way he uses logic in his speech or the way he makes an emotional appeal and attraction to his audience or the way he establishes his experience and credibility. Um, additionally, you'll need to write a thesis which describes the purpose and point of your analysis. That is, please explain what point it is you'd like to make about the rhetorical elements you're analyzing. You've got to have a point. Just like Ward and Vanderlei talk about in Chapter 1, uh, you really need to have a specific point that you're trying to make. Ultimately, you may say, well, his use of logic uh, helps serve, you know, conveying his message clearly to his audience. Well, that's a point, you know, that, that's a specific point. But you want to have some point. It requires uh, knowing exactly what your purpose is and having some confidence, too. It doesn't, doesn't hurt. Uh, but you want to have a point. That's, the, that's critical. Uh, and this could be reflected in something uh, like in your title here. Uh, for example, I give this example as a particular title. The effective use of logic in Barack Obama's Democratic nomination acceptance speech. The effective use of logic in his speech. So that could, again, it kind of points to what I'm going to be looking at. I'm going to be looking at how does he use logic in his speech, that one specific component. And that would probably be enough if examined in detail you know, to actually analyze the speech from that perspective. You could look at the use of emotion in it. You could look at the use of credibility. Um, any of these components that are mentioned in chapters one and two of, of Ward and Vanderlei really are ideal. Questions? Yes? Sure. Absolutely. A lot of times we learn more from what's not there and what doesn't function well about a speech, then what functions well? Absolutely. Other questions? Thought I saw another hand. Tyler? Should we uh, build up to the thesis or should we stay right away? Think it's a That's a great question. Uh, it's really up to you. You know, I think having a thesis at the beginning, it can't hurt. And the more clear it is, you know, the more effective. But again, the, the thesis is driven by the purpose of why you're analyzing a specific component to the, to the speech itself. So if you're thinking, well, I might analyze, you know, the use of emotion, you know, in the speech. You want to have a thesis that says, I'm analyzing his use of emotion to prove a particular point. And then what is that point? To show that's how he connects with an audience, uh, to show that's how he, you know, relates to the women in the audience, whatever, whatever it is, you know, but you've got to have a specific point, uh, which is critical. And I think having a thesis helps kind of bring that all together. Your point can be reflected in the thesis, right? Yes, it should be there. And then just a little bit of a sort of advice or suggestions here to make a point, uh, and again, they talk about making a point on pages 13 through 14 in the, uh, the Real Text book. 
So be sure to review that. But to make a point, when you identify a rhetorical element, please discuss its purpose and how well it achieves its purpose. So if you're looking at an element, like what I've been saying, you know, examine what the purpose of that element is and then how well does it actually achieve its purpose or doesn't achieve its purpose. Or if it's absent from the speech, maybe you want to analyze that as well. And then a couple of examples here. For example, with regards to credibility, the issue of credibility, if you were looking at credibility in John McCain's speech, uh, with regards to credibility, what does McCain's referring to his political experience in the speech do rhetorically? You know, what is its purpose? What, why does he say, I've had 25 years in the Senate, you know, and I've served my country honorably uh, when I was um, in the military? You know, what does that do in terms of establishing his credibility? And how well does it connect with his audience? What is its purpose and is the purpose achieved in connecting with his audience? Another example here, what is Obama's referring to his being raised by a single mother do rhetorically? You know, he mentions this in a lot of his speeches. What does that do though when he talks about that? What is the purpose of that? Uh, what is, what is, why does he say that? What is the purpose of it? You know? so, those would be you know, areas that you, specific examples, those are very specific examples of things you could analyze in relation to you know, an emotional appeal or uh, credibility. Questions, concerns? So we're right multiple points the right way. Do you have to just have multiple right That's a great question. So the question, if you guys couldn't hear that, was you know, do you have to have multiple points or one specific point. I think if I was if I was writing this as you guys, uh, I would probably choose one, maybe two of these areas to look at because of the scope of the paper is pretty short. I mean, all things considered, this is only a three to four page paper. There's not a lot of space. The speech itself will probably be double spaced, you know, eight to ten pages long, if not longer. Uh, so somehow you have to find one or two elements in that speech to analyze. So I would try to focus on one or two rhetorical elements. If you feel you can cover three, you know, keep in mind the scope of the paper. You've got three to four pages, so it's totally up to you. I, I want to stress that and emphasize that as much as I can is you've got a lot of freedom with this. You can analyze, you know, whatever components you want uh, in these speeches. And if you want to, if you want to do multiple things, you're more than welcome to do that. And it may be most effective to do that. Yasmin? Um, let's say uh, you were analyzing a speech and there was only probably a paragraph of the speech mm -hmm. that probably, I don't, know, I don't know how it affected that person or whatnot. Can the whole entire paper be about that one part and analyzing that section of the only? Sure. Or does it have to be about the whole entire speech? Absolutely. Did everybody hear the question? So if you just want to analyze one specific area of the speech, is that okay? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, analyzing the whole speech in this scope might be difficult to do. You might zero in on you know, how he talks about, uh, either one of them, how they talk about, say, economic uh, you know, gains that they, would, that they would develop as a president. And then how you know, that affects their credibility or how it, how it relates to their credibility. So you might focus on one specific area. You could look at a paragraph or two. Um, the key is to, is to hit that scope of this particular paper, which is three to four pages. So you want to think about something that's reasonable that'll fit that well, that you can examine from the speech and then deliver a three to four page paper on. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Other questions, concerns? Yes, double space, Times New Roman, font size 12. Just like, uh, well, the font size here. This, of course, is single space, but. The new Windows 07 default fonts not coming Okay. Just well, if you compare this to like Courier, you know, Courier is going to be huge. Uh, but usually, yeah, Times New Roman, font size 12, double spaced, that kind of stuff. And again, the font that's used up here on the overhead, that's Times New Roman. You guys, how many folks know what I'm talking about when I say Times New Roman? I'm about half of you. Using like Arial or Verdana or something like that. 
The key, yeah, for this, Times New Roman, like what you see over here on the overhead, is sort of standard font, uh, font size 12. So if you've got to go up and change it to Times New Roman, then, then that's what you got to do. Uh, other questions, concerns about project one? Anybody? Uh, the due date is in the syllabus. Does anybody have a copy of the printed syllabus? It is, again, it's in your course syllabus, which I have an email. All right, so what I want to do next is an assignment based on the writing that you did for Wednesday. For those folks who are new today, I can talk with you about it once I deliver how to, how to do this. Um, so go ahead and take out the writing assignment, which I turned back, which I gave back to you a minute or two ago from Wednesday. And while you're doing that, I'm going to find the date so that we can just get that out there. All right, what you're going to want to do in this particular assignment, we're going to do sort of a first round rhetorical analysis of your writing. Uh, so we're going to exercise some of the skills and tools of this project one. The purpose of doing this is kind of as an exercise to then actually doing project one. Uh, so you're going to pair up with a partner and exchange your letters, which you wrote for Wednesday. So you're going to pair up with a partner, choose a partner, pair up, and exchange your letters. Without discussing aloud the answers to the following questions, read your partner's letter and on a separate sheet of paper answer the following questions bullet style. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, but these questions, there's basically six questions here. You're going to want to try to answer in relation to your partner's letter. And this is essentially beginning to do what a rhetorical analysis does and what your project one will do. So this is kind of, again, it's exercise towards doing the type of rhetorical analysis that you'll be doing for project one. That's the purpose of doing this. Uh, let's see here. I've got the syllabus open on the computer and project one is due on September 15th. That's a Monday, so you've got the weekend to work on it. We'll have a draft of that that's due the previous week and we'll do a peer review in class on the 10th. So September 10th the draft is due and then the final will be due the following Monday the 15th. And all this is in the is in the course syllabus on the course calendar. All right. So we're right here in the middle. Uh, this here and then these questions. So you've got your in-class writing that you did for Wednesday. And without discussing aloud the answers to these questions first, you're going to exchange your letters and then try to answer this question for your partner. So uh, Tyler if you and Chris paired up together, you'd be reading Chris's letter. And you'd want to try to answer these questions in regards to Chris's letter. How would you characterize the author's purpose? So can you on a separate sheet of paper write what his purpose is? And then the next question, what is the point that Chris is trying to make and then the third question is, who is his audience? And then there are these three other questions as well. How does the author establish credibility in their letter? Is that even something that they do? They may not do it. If so, point that out. Uh, how does the author connect with your emotions in their letter? What are they doing to make an emotional appeal? And then finally, how does the author develop logic and structure in his or her letter? What is the author do to organize and structure the letter. So is that clear? Does that make sense? So be sure to take out an extra sheet of paper um, and go ahead and pair up. All right, let's sort of bring this together to a general classroom discussion if we can. Uh, let, let's hear some of these things that you found, some questions answered in in reading your partner's papers. Uh, there's nothing like having somebody else read your work to kind of give an objective sense to it and whether you're accomplishing some of these goals. 
Um, so uh, do we have a, a couple of folks who would like to go first? We'll answer some of these questions. Anybody want to sort of volunteer what you found, how you answered some of these questions? Okay. Colin, go ahead. Who is your partner? Uh, Jose. Okay, your partner was Jose, and go ahead. I was actually just going to talk about how he, um, he, the emotions of the reader, he really connected to him, because as he was talking about um, what got him into the film industry or whatever, mm -hmm. he was, um, he talked about how as he started to grow up, he realized that when everybody else kind of was growing out of like imagining things, he was kind of seeing the world as like, he was the camera and he was just like everybody was being filmed. Sure. Great. And it worked because it's like kind of seeing them inside the mind of the director created. Excellent. Yeah. It was good, good connection to the emotions. Awesome. And Jose, what did you, what are some of the things that you noticed about uh, Colin's paper, his letter? He used like a lot of colloquialism, like that style. Sure. Like, um, it was less formal, a bit more personal. Just like kind of his design. Excellent. So, you, you so it was more, for, more informal or more formal? Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Excellent. So you think that style then kind of lends itself to, to that, to achieving that purpose? Yeah. Sure. Excellent. Jacob, how about you? Who was your partner? Okay. Chris, why don't you guys go ahead then? Chris and Tyler, were you partnered up? Okay. Can you speak up just a little bit? Good. Excellent. So he had a very clear purpose uh, in his letter uh, and a very clear audience as well, it sounds like. And again, the strength of writing, I think, is, is knowing those two things. If you've got a very clear purpose and you know who your audience is, you're going to have that much more focus whenever you write. So always think about those things when you're writing. That's outstanding. Tyler, how about Chris's writing? Does it, who, what was the purpose of Chris's and who is his audience? Well, Chris was talking about Mm -hmm. He wanted to go with um, he, his audience. He was talking to uh, his girlfriend's grandparents. Nice. He was kind of informing them. I thought he did a good job of establishing credibility by giving real life examples of what he was doing. Mm -hmm. um, that demonstrated his hard work and creativity. Excellent. That's that's great. Outstanding. Somebody else want to share what you and your partner came up with? Go ahead. What's your name again? Lizzie. Lizzie. And who was your partner, Lizzie? Um, I read Catherine's letter. Okay. And um, she, I her purpose was to um, prove that she was qualified for a job. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that she did a really good job of building her credibility also because she talked about different characteristics that she had, like um, her dependability and her level-headedness. Awesome. And, Mm -hmm. Great. Was there a specific employer in mind or, or a particular type of job? Uh, it was um, just an engineering position. That's great. That's that's a fairly you know defined audience. Uh, Absolutely. Gates, <laughs> well, there you go. You know, nothing like starting at the top. You got to start at the top and work your way down. I always say, you know, that's great. Now, what did Lizzie? Who was her audience? Okay, who was Brooke's audience? Uh, a potential husband. Okay. And, and uh, so what was the purpose? And her purpose was to say, hey, I'd be a great housewife for you. Okay. So um, she was talking about like all her domestic skills and it like directly correlated to what would make a good wife. So and she was talking about like how she's generous and stuff and how like if there were two pieces of pizza left, he, she'd give him a bigger one. <laughs> <laughs> and that appealed to him. Outstanding, excellent. So you you were sold. You think she can definitely find a husband? Great. Right? <laughs> and Brooke, you had Lizzie's. Well, who was her audience? Great. I think she did a good job. It was very formal, and she 
mentor in Turning Point, and like it was at the show and already got the job, so nice. she did a good job for being like a coach. She was very excited to have the job, and she did a good job for the school. That's outstanding. That's a really clear focus to have in mind. And Delisa, how about you? Who was your partner? Um, I think Matt. Okay, Matt. And what, what, who was Matt's audience? Um, a coach. Coach? Yeah. For, um, he said just any coach, but mm -hmm. I read it as like a college coach. But, um, so what yeah. was the purpose in contacting this coach? His purpose wasn't in there, but for his, um, mm -hmm. what I wrote down, I put that he should like put his purpose within the first paragraph. Sure. It's great, great advice. It's great to have an audience. It's it's great to know why you're writing to the audience too. It's great. And how about uh, Delisa? What? Who is her audience? Uh, Matt. Uh, so oh, that's right. I remember. And she did a really good job, like establishing credibility, saying you know she's class, vice president, and everything. Mm -hmm. Giving some confidence. She uh, she did a good job with that. Mm -hmm. She was there. Sure. She was with Gal. Comes over. They give a specific example. Like her leadership skills. Excellent. Somebody else? Go ahead, yes, me. Who was your partner? Stephanie. Stephanie, okay. Um, Who was her audience and what was the purpose? Right. Her audience was uh, her grandchildren. And the purpose was to um, actually just connect with her grandchildren and also connect with her own grandparents. She built a different perspective by mm -hmm. explaining, introducing herself, but 50 years from now. Yes. That's great. It's very which creative. Is, which is a really great way to promote the ethos. Mm -hmm. Is it ethos? Sure. Emotions? Oh, no, that's pathos. Pathos. To connect with someone's emotions, to feel that, you know, you're talking to your grandparents as well as your grandchildren mm -hmm. at the same time. Excellent. Yeah, it's very creative, and it would tug at the heartstrings, if you will. It would be very emotional to, to, think, about, to think about that. So, Stephanie, who was uh, Yasmin's uh, audience, and what was her purpose? Excellent. Outstanding. Very good. Uh, I want to kind of keep things moving here. I've got a lot planned for today, but you guys are beginning to get a sense of what this rhetorical analysis is all about. Uh, and you can do this in regards to your own writing. In fact, when I was drawing up the lesson plan for today, I said, well, would, I asked myself, would this be more interesting for, for y'all to analyze your own rhetorically or to have a partner analyze your, your letter? And I kind of was on the fence for a little while. I was like, well, it's it's easier to have somebody else kind of look at your writing and say this is what works well about it and what could work a little bit better sometimes too. So that was why I went in that particular direction. But the point is that you're going to be writing a rhetorical analysis. So some of these tools that you're exercising right here when you're reading a simple letter and saying well this establishes credibility or this establishes an emotional connection. Uh, you can examine these things in a letter or you can examine them in a speech delivered by you know, the, the nominee of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Or you could be using these same tools, again, in analyzing you know, a document in the biological sciences or in chemistry or, or whatever. They're really sort of universal. Shifting gears a little bit, I want to uh, kind of focus on, we're going to be building towards a speech here that I'd like to, to bring in and as a gateway of sort of segueing into that I've got a video that I'd like to to watch. Uh, basically this next little component here for the next 25 minutes or so we're going to be talking about uh, Tiananmen Square and Beijing. I thought this would be kind of interesting how many folks watched some of the Olympics in the past couple of weeks. So Beijing has really in China in general has kind of been in the spotlight of the world media and I thought it would be neat to kind of look back to where they were just not too long ago in this particular uh, tragic circumstance and then to look at how the students at a particular university responded to that. So let's hope this video works. And All right. 
So this is a uh, this is a news news footage from the BBC on June fourth, nineteen eighty nine, in the midst of the Tiananmen Square massacre. So this will put it in a little bit of historical context. The document that we're going to be analyzing here in a minute or two. The noise of the. Say again. Oh yeah. Sure. Sorry about that. And can you guys see that pretty well from back there? The video footage, you know, like YouTube, it's kind of crappy, but uh, the audio is pretty good. Rose from all over the center of Peking. It was unremitting. On the streets leading down to the main road to Tiananmen Square, furious people stared in disbelief at the glow in the sky, listening to the sound of shots. Heading down the road was a hazardous business, but hundreds of people cheered as buses were set alight and army trucks caught fire too. They yelled and shouted, and then as troop lorries were seen moving down the road, there was gunfire from those lorries. The troops have been firing indiscriminately, but still there are thousands of people on the streets who will not work back. The bicycle rickshaws scooped up the injured. Others were shunted onto bikes and pedaled to hospital. Many were carried away by frantic local residents. And there was confusion and despair among those who could hardly credit that their own army was firing wildly at them. Many were bystanders, perhaps naive about the savagery of the situation. Indeed, it was hard at times to grasp that this army was launching into an unarmed civilian population as if charging into battle. From Tiananmen Square, the sound of gunfire sounded like a battle, but it was one-sided. A line of soldiers was strung out facing a huge crowd. The air was filled with shouts of fascists, stop killing. We were in the line facing the troops. They were about 250 yards away. Young people were singing the international to a background of gunfire. After hours of shooting and facing a line of troops, the crowd is still here. The shooting stop the killing and down with the government. A huge volley of shots just as I left the front line caused panic. The young man in front of me fell dead. I fell over him. Two others were killed yards away. Two more people lay wounded on the ground near me. Ambulances screamed up to the troop line and were turned away. They couldn't get to the square. Two ambulance drivers were shot and injured. Earlier, we'd been driving at the back of the forbidden city, the old part of Peking, near the square. We picked up a woman with a bullet in the head and took her to the nearby children's hospital, into a cedar near Mayhem. Casualties were arriving every few seconds, on bikes, rickshaws, park benches, carried in, all with gunshot wounds. Housewives, elderly residents, people shot while sitting in their homes. The operating theatre was overflowing, many of the staff in tears. In 20 minutes, 40 seriously injured were brought for emergency surgery. Two were already dead. In the streets, many came up to us, shaking with anger and disbelief and fear. Many were terrified, saying there would be retribution. There was not one voice on the streets which did not express despair and rage. Tell the world, they said to us. How many folks, you guys were all born like after 89, right? So this is kind of history prior to when you were born, right? This occurred in 1989. Uh, who could tell me like what, what, was the, what was the cause of this uh, uprising? Anybody know just sort of general trivia, world trivia? Human rights, right? Right, pro-democracy. Uh, which is what we're going to be kind of segueing into here. Basically, students like you guys, your age said we want democracy in our country and this this general student movement caused uh, a huge uprising in the country that led to 
a lot of death and then led to, some would argue, some advancement in the country and some would say not enough advancement, uh, democratically speaking, in the country. And I'm going to put a document up on the doc cam here in a minute uh, related to this. But I kind of wanted to get a sort of a historical background and then look at a particular document that kind of was a part of this mix. And I'm putting up a couple of questions here on the sideboard as well for this particular document. Who is the author? Who is the audience? And then I haven't discussed this much, but sometimes you have a primary audience and a secondary audience, which is a distinction I'm drawing up here on the board. But who is the uh, author? Who is the audience? And then ultimately, what is the purpose as well? Again, all things that you could be using in a rhetorical analysis. So again, who is the author of this document that you're seeing now on the board? Uh, who is the audience for it, the primary audience and perhaps a secondary audience as well? And then what is the document's purpose? And we'll read as much of this as time allows for in class. But I'd like you to be thinking about these things. We're not going to answer these. We're not going to have time to do that. But you can answer them in your mind as you're reading this. You know, who is the author of this document? Who is the audience? I think that's one of the things that's most fascinating to me with this, is who are they actually writing to? Uh, and then, what is the purpose? Why, why, was this, why was this written? And I'll get us started by reading just the first couple of paragraphs, and then we're going to toss it around to a couple of folks to, to read from there forward. I'll keep an eye on the time, and we'll get through, we'll read as much of this as we can. Uh, it reads, the May 16 circular issued in 1966 is, in the minds of the Chinese um, people, nothing but a symbol of tyranny and darkness. 23 years have passed, and today we are feeling the strong appeal of democracy and light. History has eventually come to a turning point. So again, you know, this was written in 1989, May 16, 1989. Uh, currently, a nationwide patriotic democratic movement pioneered by young students is gaining momentum. In less than one month, large-scale mass demonstrations rose one after another in Beijing <clears throat> and other parts of the country, surging forward with great force. Several hundred thousand students took to the streets protesting against corruption, calling for democracy and the rule of law, expressing the common opinions of workers, peasants, army men, cadres, intellectuals, and all other people in the working class. This is the great awakening of the whole nation, which inherited and surpassed the May 4th movement that originated in 1919 with demonstrations for democracy and science. This is an important juncture in history that will decide China's destiny. Uh, could somebody read like the next, par the next two paragraphs, if you would? Somebody who can project a little bit so everybody can hear you. Go ahead, Yasmin. Since the third plenary session of the 11th Party Congress of the Central Committee held in December 1978, China has engaged in a modernization that promises national rejuvenation. Unfortunately, due to the slack development of political system reform, the economic reform that has won its initial successes is suffering a serious setback. Corruption becomes daily rampant. Social conflicts have been sharply intensified, and the cause of reform is confronted with great crisis. China is at a critical moment in history, at a time when the fate of the people country and the party in power to be decided today, May 16, 1989, we, Chinese intellectuals at home and overseas who jointly signed the statement, solemnly declare in public our principal stand. That's great. Let's stop there for a minute. Again, think about who is the author of this, who is the audience for this particular document, and then what is this document's purpose? I'll continue here to the bottom of the page and then we'll toss it over to somebody else. 
Uh, we hold that the Chinese Communist Party and the government have not adopted a wise attitude. We hold that they have not adopted a wise attitude toward the current student movement. And signs show that not long ago, they even intended to handle the student movement with high pressure and violence. Lessons should be drawn from history. Such autocratic regimes as the Beijing government of 1919, the Kuomintang government of, in the 1930s and 40s, and the Gang of Four in the late 1970s all suppressed the student movements with violence. Yet, without exception, they all ended up with humiliating failure. Anybody want to take a, a read at that? Anybody who can kind of project? Matt, you, can you see that well enough to read it? History has proved that those who try to repress the student movement are destined to come, up, to, come to a disgraceful end. Recently, the Chinese Communist Party and the government began to take a praiseworthy, sensible stand, which has somewhat eased the tension. If they follow the laws of modern democratic politics, defer, you know, defer to the little people, go along with the world trends and there will appear a democratic and stable China. Otherwise, a China with bright prospects will very possibly be led to the real of this economy. Great. Somebody want to take point two? Colin, how about you? To handle the present political crisis, the unavoidable prerequisite that we need to recognize the legality of the autonomous student organization formed by the democratic procedures. The denial of this prerequisite will should be in the period of uh, associated with stipulated in China's constitution. The autonomous student organization was once labeled illegal, which resulted in nothing but the aggravation of conflicts and the intensification of crisis. Excellent. Point three, it is government officials' corruption strongly opposed by young students in the patriotic movement that directly caused the current political crisis. The most serious error in the past 10 years reform was not made in education, but in the negligence of political system reform. So again, thinking about who the audience for this is, who the authors were, and what the purpose of this document is, which are all components of rhetorical analysis. These are tools that you could use in analyzing any type of document, whether it's a, a letter written or whether it's a speech written or what have you. Who is the author? Who is the audience? And what is the purpose of a document? Uh, the privileged bureaucratic system and feudalist prerogatives that remain basically intact in the reform have entered the economic situation. This is the genuine cause for pernicious corruption, which has not only devoured the fruits of economic reform, but also shaken the people's confidence in the Chinese Communist Party and the government. The party and government should learn a profound lesson from this and satisfy the people's demands in earnest by continuously carrying out the reform of the political system, abolishing prerogatives, eliminating, quote, official profiteering, and clearing up corruption. So there's an economic component to this. While the student movement was going on, news agencies such as the People's Daily and the Xinhua News Agency withheld the true facts and deprived the citizens of their right to know. The Communist Party Committee of Shanghai City suspended Mr. Ken Ben Li, chief editor of the newspaper World Economic News, from his duties. They suspended him. The completely erroneous course of action mentioned above reflects an attitude of brazen neglect of the Constitution. Freedom of the press is an effective means to combat corruption, maintain national stability, and promote social development. Absolute power without any supervision or restriction will definitely lead to absolute corruption. If press freedom is not actually practiced, if any non-official newspaper is not allowed to exist, then all the aspirations and promises for reform and opening to the outside world will be nothing but hollow words. Somebody want to take point number five here? Go ahead. 
was wrong to define the student movement as an anti-party, anti-socialist political turmoil. The basic meaning of freedom of speech is the recognition and protection of the citizens' right to voice their political dis dis dissidence. Every single political movement since the liberation of China in 1949 was waged to suppress disagreeing political opinions. A society with only one voice is by no means a stable society. It is necessary for the Chinese Communist Party and the government to remind themselves of the historical lesson drawn from the bitter experience of the eliminating of the Wu Fang counter revolutionary click. Excellent. It is wrong to propagate the exposure and punishment of the so-called handful of, quote, bearded backstage manipulators behind the student movement. All citizens of the People's Republic of China, whether old or young, are politically equal in status and have equal rights to participate in and comment on political affairs. Liberty, democracy, and legality are never condescendingly bestowed gifts. All those who seek after truth and love freedom should make unremitting efforts to actually gain the rights our Constitution promised to every citizen, namely freedom of thought, freedom of association, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of publication, freedom of assembly, and freedom of demonstration. We have come to a critical turning point in history. The disaster-ridden Chinese nation should not miss its last opportunity, and there is no other way out. Chinese intellectuals who inherited the patriotic tradition and are constantly concerned about their country and people should be aware of their unshirkable historical responsibility, step forward bravely to push forward the advance of democracy and strive for the building of politically democratic and economically developed modern China. Long live the people, long live the free and democratic motherland. So again, things to be thinking about as we're reading this is who actually wrote the document? Anybody have an idea? Chinese Say again, Sonny. Chinese journalists. Chinese journalists, that's an idea. Sure, Tyler. Chinese intellectuals, yeah. The supporters of the movement, absolutely. Who is the audience, do you see, for this? The government. And the world. Absolutely. And, you know, the moment of inspiration or the thought, the reason why I brought this in is, you know, I mentioned on Wednesday that, you know, at 18 or 19, you can change the world. Never set a ceiling on yourself because of your age. I've used it in Wednesday, on Wednesday, to talk about the folks who developed Facebook, you know, are 19 or 20 years old, and this thing has completely revolutionized social networking on the internet. In China, the youth of that nation took a stand and, and said, we must have freedom, and it must be implemented and executed. And by doing that, they, some would say they've developed the country some. Some would argue that it's not developed enough and human rights still needs to be addressed. Uh, I just thought it would be interesting to bring this in, in contrast to what we've been watching in the Olympics and to kind of see how far things have come in the past decade or so. Um, we're just about out of time here. I think we have about five minutes, eight minutes until 7.15, which is, yes. Oh, okay. No, I wasn't expecting you. Yes. Come on in and do your thing. Go right ahead. We have somebody here from the Writing Center who's going to talk about the tutorial services uh, from the Writing Center. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I Take it away. You know.